to know that we've got a God that when, he, uh, when we're washed by the blood, when he, he's actually in us and we can place all our hope in him. Um, he's, a, he's an incredible God. Um, this morning, we just, every time we come to church, we want to grow deeper in that relationship with God. It's, you might say, well, I'm already saved. Our, he already lives inside of me. Um, but if salvation was the end game, then we'd be with him in heaven right now. But for some reason, we're still here. So it's not the end game. That was just a way to have a relationship with God. So, of course, we want to grow deeper in, in that relationship with God. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to Daniel chapter 1 this morning. Um, Daniel is one of the most intriguing people in the Bible to me. Now, I just, I'm going to stop because everybody just smiled. Um, the... The picture came up on the screen, and for some reason you stopped listening to me, <laughs> which I expected um, on a, to a certain degree. It will make sense. You just have to stay with me. That's just the rules. You just stay with me. All, it will all make sense. Daniel is one of those characters in the Bible. When you look at Daniel... Um, Read the book of Daniel. And by the way, the beginning of the book of Daniel, has it's kind of like a cool story. And then the farther you get into it, then you've got uh, prophetic signs and stuff like that where it doesn't flow the same as the beginning of the book. But if you want to look at the story of Daniel, look at the, be the first few chapters of Daniel. It's an intriguing story. When Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity, Daniel was just a young man. He was a good person and he has a strong love for God. God warned Israel about the captivity years in advance. It wasn't just something where people came in and took them, took them into captivity. God told them in advance. He told them if they refused to turn back to him, then he would allow them to hit rock bottom in order to wake them up. And by the way, that, that's just good parenting. Um, sometimes you have to let them hit rock bottom because that's the only way you can love them. It's sometimes we're stubborn people and the only way we can learn is to hit rock bottom. So God chooses to use that same thing. He says, I'm going to have to let you hit. But I'm telling you, captivity is coming. If you will not turn your heart back to me, captivity is coming. So he, it's not like he hid it from him. He let him know, this is coming. Here's your options. <laughs> you, you listen to what I'm saying or otherwise you're going to have to hit rock bottom. And God allows that to happen. Israel refused to listen to God, and the Babylonian army came in and took the nation of Israel into captivity. Now, Daniel was a victim of Israel's wicked decisions. <clears throat> Daniel has a heart for God. If you look at Daniel alone, he wouldn't have gone into captivity based on his own heart. But Daniel ends up being a victim to Israel's wicked decisions. And we could easily cry out to God and tell him that it was unfair that this bad thing was allowed to happen to this good person. <clears throat> it would be easy to look at that and say, okay, that's not fair, God. Why, did, why didn't you leave him out? But if it would have never happened, we wouldn't have this account in the Bible. And redemption would never have been brought to Israel through the influence that Daniel had in Babylon. God allowed this to happen, allowed a bad thing to happen to a good person because he knew what that good person was capable of doing because his heart was connected to God and God needed him in that situation. So we can get mad at God when bad things happen to good people or we can understand that God's going to work everything out together for good because he's got a plan behind all this and we just need to trust him. <clears throat> I want to look closer at the character of this young man because like I said it's intriguing to me. He's been taken into captivity and the king has ordered that the best looking and smartest men be put into the king's service. Of course, that's what the king would do. Like, I want the real good looking guys and those smart kids. I want, I want them brought into the service of the king. And the king has presented Daniel with some high quality food. He's not just given them the food that we typically think, you know, you're a prisoner, you get bread and water type thing. No, the king's presenting them with some delicacies, going to give them some good food. So let's look at verse 8 of chapter 1 in the book of Daniel. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, Daniel is politely refusing this gift from the king. It's not like he's just bowing up his back and saying, absolutely not, get it out of my face. No, he's asking politely. He's, he's asking that, I don't want to defile myself with this. Would this be okay? He even strikes a deal um, 
with the the officials. He's like, I just want to make a deal with you. Could I, me and my friends, could we just eat the vegetables? Everybody else can have all the delicacies because we don't want to defile ourselves. In Babylonian culture, animals would be killed and offered to their gods as victorious sacrifices. It was part of their worship. Athenius called the beasts which were which are uh, served at the tables of the Persian kings, he actually referred to those beasts as victims. It wasn't just game or, or prey. It was, he called them victims. And this was a picture of true worship to false gods. To eat these sacrifices showed willingness to bow under the conquering authority of the gods. It was all symbolic. And this false belief system actually was uh, addressed later in the book of 1 Corinthians. I want to look at this real quick. This, this idea didn't just stop in Daniel's day. It went into the New Testament time too. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 4. It says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other god but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many idols, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all thing, are all things, and through him we live. However, there is not, er, not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of, of the idol, until now eat as, it, as a thing offered to an idol." and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God. For either if we eat, are we better, nor if we do not eat, are we the worse. But, but beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Paul points out that the idols amount to nothing. They're just idols. If I go outside and I carve a piece of wood and I turn it into an image of some sort, that is no more a god than it was when it was still a tree. Paul's just saying the idols are nothing. The idols don't amount to anything at all. And though people, are, people worshipped many gods, there's actually no other god than the one true god. Paul is pointing this out. They can worship a piece of wood all they want, but it's not a god. There's only one god. And even though the meat was offered to idols, it was just meat and it was good for eating. I'm telling you, if you offer a ribeye steak to an idol and then you say, would you like the ribeye steak? It's still hot. I offered it to the idol. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I would like that ribeye steak. That's, that's my thing. I would, it's still a good piece of meat. Did the meat change? Is it, is it bad in any way? So Paul's saying that it's still, it's still good for eating. Paul was just explaining in this passage that this could be a stumbling block to those to, who don't understand it. If they still had the mindset that this meat was offered to the idol and therefore it goes against God, Paul was saying, then don't eat it. Don't eat, if it's going to be a stumbling block to that person because they don't understand the truth about it, then abstain from it. Just stay away from it because you care about the person. So it, there's nothing wrong with the meat. If these people saw you eating it, eating what was offered to the idols, it may shake their faith because of their lack of understanding. So this time, don't eat it because you care about the person and help them grow in understanding. That's what Paul is meant bringing up here. Daniel was facing the same obstacle in his time. But for him to eat the meat, it would have sent out a message that he condoned the practice for which that meat was given. So he's like, I'm not going to do it because I know what that meat means to you. So I'm going to stay away from it. I'm not going to defile myself with that. Not only that, but that in the Old Testament, you had the, the, the food laws and stuff like that, and he wasn't going to defile. He wasn't going to go against those laws. Now he's taking a risky stand for God, and God ends up blessing him. Daniel and his friends eat vegetables for 10 days and are healthier and stronger at the end of the 10 days than everyone else is. So God blesses Daniel because of his heart. <sighs> You give me a ribeye for 10 days or a carrot for 10 days, chances are I'm not going to make that call. But he knew what it, what it symbolized. He knew what it was about. And he says, I'm going to refuse it. And he actually grew stronger through that time because of the stand he took for God. Now, I want to go back and look at the reason for this achievement in Daniel's life. This story would have played out so much different if it wasn't for that first action that Daniel took. Daniel took a, an action. It wasn't, it wasn't the carrot. It was the heart that he had for God. Look at verse 8 one more time with me. Daniel 1.8. 
But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. This is the action that made this story a godly success. That action right there. He purposes in his heart not to defile himself. What God does through the life of Daniel is an amazing, an amazing story. But it never would have happened if it wasn't for this move on Daniel's part. Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. Now we can look at this story and give credit to Daniel for winning this one battle by refusing what the king offered. We could say, all right, let's give him credit for that. But honestly, Daniel deserves so much more credit than that. You see, Daniel did not purpose in his heart to stand up for God in this one event. That's not what he's doing that day. He's not just saying, I'm going to refuse this and that's what God wants. He's doing something greater than just refusing the delicacies that the, that the king's offering here. He purposed in his heart to do so much more. He's actually purposing in his heart not to defy God. Now, how do we defy God? What, what's the way we defy God? We choose to sin. Sin is a defiance to God. So he's, he purposes in his heart, I'm not going to defy God. And because he determined in his heart to seek God in his whole life, not just in this one event, the character of man that he was also grew into something far more than he could have ever anticipated. He's growing into a stronger man for God than he ever was before because of this decision in his life. Years later, when Daniel was an old man, a new king shows up on the scene named King Darius. And he took notice of who Daniel had become. Let's look at chapter 6 and verse 3. It says, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. The character of man that Daniel was fed off of his desire to live for God. That's, his character is changing because he has such a strong desire to live for God that his character is following suit with that desire. He was a man of honor and integrity and it didn't take another Christian to be able to identify that. It, you didn't need another Christian to say, yep, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. The king loved what he saw in Daniel and the king wanted to place him over the whole realm. I love the character of this guy. It didn't take a Christian to identify this. The king understood there's something different about this guy. He's purposing in his heart. He's determined. He's determined to please his God. And I like the character of man he's becoming because of this. <clears throat> this was not an idea that the other higher-ups were in favor of. You've got all these governors and stuff, and they're not in favor of this idea that Daniel would be set over the whole realm. So they had to come up with a plan to take Daniel out of the picture. Of course, if you're trying to fight for the, that top rung on the ladder, you're going to have to do something to pull the next guy down, or they're going to get it, and you're not. So let's look at verse 4 of chapter 6. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. If we're going to trip this guy up, there's only one way we're going to trip him up because his character is solid. This is a good guy. So if we're going to trip him up, we're going to have to do it a little bit different. See, they ran into a problem. He is actually determined in his heart to please God with his life. It's not just a one-time decision he made. He purposed in his heart to give everything to God, not for one event, but for his whole life. So when they run into a determined person like this, they realize there's not, we're not going to find fault in this guy. He's going to do it right because he loves God. So the only way we're going to be able to take him down is to do something that changes his relationship with his God. That's, all, that's the only way we can take him down. This wasn't just something he desired to try out. It was something that he was going to be unwavering on. He purposed in his heart. He's not going to move. He's going to live for God with his whole life. So they realized that the only way to take a person like this down was by finding a way to interfere with what he loved. They're going to have to get between him and God. That's what they're going to have to do because that's what his relationship is founded on. He loves God. Let's look at verse 6 of Daniel chapter 6. 
So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to, to him, King Darius, live forever. Here's the kissing up part that they do right here. King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. <clears throat> These men have just devised a plan that makes it so if anybody prays to any god or man other than King Darius, they'll be thrown into the den of lions. They are really buttering this king up. Man, people should only pray to you. Because that Babylonian that Babylonian culture, their king was a god. It's same as the Egyptian cultures. They, they viewed their king way up there. So it says, hey, King Darius, for 30 days, I don't think anybody should pray to anybody, any man or any god. They shouldn't ask for anything from anybody except for you. They should only pray to you. They fed on the pride of King Darius. <clears throat> And they persuaded him to make a law without considering the consequences of that law. And King Darius signs the decree. Hey, that sounds good. It sounds good. I'm top dog. Let's, let's do that. Let's just sign it. They knew that Daniel loved God and would not be able to ignore him for 30 days. You, you have such a good relationship with your God, it would kill you not to talk to him for 30 days. They saw a love in Daniel that they didn't see anybody else having. Like, it would kill him not to talk to his God. So the only way we're going to get Daniel out of the way is if we create a law that makes it so he has to tear the heart of God out. I have to do something to hurt my God, and I won't do that. And they know he's not going to do that. This is a man who's firmly determined to follow God. And they know it. Daniel's not, he's not giving up. He's not going to waver. The reason the den of lions was included in this plan was because they knew that death was what Daniel would choose given the option between that and disobeying God. Does, that tells us something about the character of Daniel. If we've got to throw a den of lions into the plan, that means we know his heart and he's not going to deny his God. So we can at least kill him. We can at least get him out of the way. So they throw the den of lions in there. And, and you know what? They were right. He wasn't going to be able to shut off his relationship with God because he purposed in his heart. Let's look at verse 10 of chapter 6. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with the windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Remember that day when Daniel was younger and he's, the king offers all the delicacies and he purposed in his heart not to defile God? Well, he's still determined to keep that commitment. He checks in with God three times each day and has done so since he was young. He's an old man now by this chapter. But it says since early days. He determined back then that he was going to, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. He's going to have a good relationship with God. Now he's an old man and he's still determined to keep that commitment. He checks in with God three times a day. <clears throat> now by the way, that tells us something about his character also. Why check in three times a day? Honestly, if we were to take a poll, how many Christians actually check in with God three times a day? Like a serious conversation, not like, hey, just checking in. No, you, you're actually having a conversation with God, making sure your heart is lined up with His heart three times a day. This is how, how many Christians do we think would actually do that? That's what Daniel's doing here. Because he knows he's susceptible to Satan's tricks. And he refuses to leave that door open for Satan to walk through. I'm going to stop. I'm going to check in three times a day because I really, really need to stay on track with you. Because I know if I give in anywhere, I'm, I'm going to fall because I'm weak 
and I, and I need you. So he checks in with God over and over again. This is the only trap that would have removed Daniel from power. We've got to put a wedge between him and his God. And Daniel recognizes the trap and he does absolutely nothing to avoid it. I will not, I will not turn my back on God. So he does nothing to protect himself. Let's look at verse 13. So they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. The king likes this guy. Remember, he wanted to put him over the whole realm. He really likes Daniel. And then he realizes, oh no, I made a decree. And I hurt this, this guy that I really respect. I, d I didn't think ahead. I signed this thing. And it says that he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver Daniel. The trap's been set. Daniel's faithfulness has been reported. He's still following his God. And the king knows that there's only one thing left to do. And the king tries everything within his power to protect Daniel. But according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, not even the king could reverse his own decree. Let's look at verse 16. So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke saying to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. The truth is this should be the end of the story right here. You throw people to hungry lions. Well, that's the curtains on that show. It's over. <laughs> it's just the end of the story. But it's not the end of the story because God honored his determination in pursuing a relationship with God. He wants this relationship and God honors this. Daniel did not just purpose in his mind to serve God. He purposed in his heart to serve God. This wasn't just some idea to try out. He was going to stand firm on this because of his love for God. He wasn't going to waver. He actually fell in love with God and he was going to do everything he could to work on that relationship and grow deeper with God. Let's look at verse 19 here of chapter 6. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My, ki my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. God honors Daniel's determination. I mean, that would be one rough night. You're thrown into the den of lions. You don't know what's coming next. You just trust God. Even if I die in here, at least I didn't turn my back on God. You're thrown in there to hungry lions and you just wait. All right, what, what happens next? <laughs> and you just wait and you wait. It doesn't take long before you realize God's got this because I should already, this should be the end of my story already. Maybe, maybe he used one as a pillow. I don't know, but he completely rested in God that night. I just trust you. This heart is why I find Daniel to be one of the most intriguing people in the Bible. That's an incredible character. That's an incredible heart. And I want to let everyone who's listening know that you can have this same kind of heart. You can have this kind of heart and I can have this kind of heart. Now you think about that. Yeah, throw me before lions. I don't think we're ready. At least me personally. You throw me in front of lions, throw in a change of pants with it. That's just how, that's how we're going to have to do this. Because I don't know how I'm going to deal with this situation. I don't know what I'm going to do here. Daniel, on the other hand, completely trusts God. If we're going to have a heart like Daniel had, which every one of us can have a heart like this, 
we first have to get past the problem. So what's the problem? Last week I mentioned that there's never been a problem that's been fixed by simply adding the solution to the problem. You can't fix any problem by adding the solution. The solution cannot be added, just be added. It needs to replace the problem. Otherwise, you still have the problem. You don't take a sinful life and just plug Jesus into it and say it's all better. No, you've got to, you, you, need to, you need to turn away from the sin. Replace the problem with the solution. Don't just add another ingredient to your life. I want to take this idea a little bit deeper this week. <clears throat> and I want to introduce both the problem and the solution with one verse. What's keeping us from having a heart like Daniel had? Let's look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here's the solution that is meant to replace the problem. I mean, everybody sees the problem and the solution there, right? You got good and evil. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The issue we have with this solution is that we have to be very aware of the problem and also purpose in our heart to yield to the remedy. This is where the condition of our hearts are going to be revealed, even right now. If you're open to the Word of God right now and your heart and mind are open right now, this is going to reveal something about your heart and something about my heart right now. For the next few minutes, we're going to remove the shell of our heart. Just uncover it just for a few minutes and take a look at what's inside. I know we hate doing that, but it's, it's good for us. Let's go ahead and remove that cover just for a few minutes and look at what's inside. I'd like to use an example from my own life to help illustrate this idea of overcoming evil with good. At the same time, I hope to clarify the real struggle that comes with this. Because it, you look at the verse and you say, overcome evil with good. I'm going to replace the evil with the good. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. But there's a major struggle with applying this verse to our life. <clears throat> you may think it sounds simple. Just replace the evil with the good, right? It sounds pretty simple. But if it were really that simple, don't you think we would have all done it by now? Do we all still struggle with sin? <laughs> So it's got to be a little bit more complicated than just, oh, take the bad out, put the good in, and we're fixed. No, there's a struggle going on here. There's, there's a problem here. Let me try to explain the struggle this way. You see that picture in the middle of the screen that everybody just kind of smiled about at the beginning? Let me go ahead and try to make a connection here. If you were to ask me what my favorite kind of pop was, I would be able to confidently tell you is Mountain Dew. Now, everybody differs on that, but for me, I love Mountain Dew. I love the flavor. I love that fizz, how it burns when it goes down your throat. I, I like it. it it's, it's awesome. I really enjoy it. I like the citrus smell when you first open it, that citrus smell. I like the sweetness of it. I like Mountain Dew. Confidently, I can tell you that would be my favorite pop. It has been six years since I've had a Mountain Dew or any other kind of pop. I have not touched it for six years, and I have a really good reason for it. I used to work nights. Sometimes it was 12-hour shifts that I would work, and Mountain Dew helped me stay awake many of those nights. I needed that caffeine. Mountain Dew's got quite a bit of caffeine, and that's, I just I just pour it down my throat. And I'd wake up, and I was good to go for a little bit longer. Then I learned some incredibly disappointing news. Crush my world. Shattered hopes, dreams, all smashed. You know, it's bad news here. Pop has absolutely no nutritional value in it at all. And it can actually cause harm to your body. Yeah, see, I didn't need to hear that. That's, some things are better left unknown. <laughs> now, please put me on record for this, if you're the one taking records in here. I am not preaching against pop, okay? Remember that time that you preached against pop? That's not what I'm doing. I'm not preaching against pop this morning. When I found out that pop was not benefiting me at all, not even a little bit, 
the question that I asked was, then why am I drinking it? You know, your body is created to put out carbon dioxide and take in oxygen. Plants are the opposite. They put out the oxygen and take in the carbon dioxide. <laughs> well, when we drink carbonated drink, what are we doing? We're just pouring that carbon dioxide right in. Just fill me up. We can buy it in a 12 pack. You can get 24. You can have as much, go to the fountain drink. Just keep it coming. Keep it coming. That's what I did. That's what I was doing. So I set out to give up pop altogether. If it's not benefiting me, and it actually could be harming me, then I'm going to get rid of this stuff altogether. I'm just going to shut it out of my life. I made it for a day or two, and then I found myself drinking another can of pop. Why? It tastes good. The fizz burns. The citrus smell. The sweetness. It's all there. And, and I, so I found myself drinking another can of pop. Then I reminded myself, you know, as if I forgot that I wanted to give it up. I want to just walk away from it because there's, it's not helping me at all and it could be harming me. And this back and forth struggle went on for some time. I'm going to quit. And somebody said, hey, you want that? Yes, I do. And I drink another one. It's just, I was right back. Then one day I made up my mind that I will not drink pop anymore. I determined I'm not going to do it. That night I went to work and they, they put out an appreciation dinner for all the workers. <sighs> Good job, guys. Here's all this free food. And guess what? The vending machines are open. Much as you want. Right? All the pop you can drink and it's free. Now that happened the night that I determined I'm not doing it anymore. I come into work and like, it's all free and it's yours. Like, sure it is. Of course, why not? Why not tonight? Let's do that. So I took a can. I grabbed a can of Mountain Dew and I went and sat down. And I had eaten about half of my meal and I still had an unopened can of Mountain Dew sitting in front of me. Half my meal is gone and I'm, I'm sitting there staring at this thing. Now, no one knew I was trying to quit. If I would have drank that thing, nobody would have thought twice. Nobody was, but I knew the fight within me. I knew what I wanted to do. But I realized that to give in would only reinforce the weakness that was obviously already in me. My desire was to go back to it. Apparently I'm weak. So I'm going to, to give in to it is only going to reinforce that weakness. I used to suffer with sinus infections all the time severe seasonal allergies. I was drained and I couldn't even sleep. I had a hard time falling asleep. I gave up pop and all those things changed in my life. Now, again, not preaching against pop. If I were to take you out to eat and you ordered a glass of pop, I'd pay for it for you. That's your choice. I, this is not, I'm not preaching against pop. I just want to use this as an illustration because it's a clear illustration to me about this principle of purposing in your heart. The pleasures of Mountain Dew were very difficult for me to walk away from. I enjoyed every aspect of it. I could get rid of a 12 pack in a, in a night. It's not a problem. I could handle it. <clears throat> More caffeine, just keep me awake. I loved it, but at the same time, it was making me miserable and I didn't even realize it. I didn't even realize it. Daniel understood that sin might be enjoyable, but it would eventually destroy him. So he purposes in his heart not to defile himself. I don't want to sin. You see, if sin wasn't pleasurable at all, it would never be a temptation. It, of course, it's gonna, there's pleasures there. Look at Hebrews 11.24. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. The pleasures of sin are there. It's a real thing. There's no temptation to something that you despise. There's got to be a draw there. There's got to be a pleasure of some kind. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it at all. But even God records that sin has pleasures but it fades away quickly. It's gone fast. And after it's gone, we have to find a deeper sin in order to continue finding pleasure. You've got to get deeper and deeper into the sin. 
And before long, we've, in, we've destroyed our lives. Let me show you a very rarely applied verse in the Bible. We feel that we're applying it many times, but we're just skimming the surface. Let's look at this verse in James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Many people think that this verse means is that if we tell the devil no, that he will leave us alone. Nope. That's not it. That's not it. Satan tempted me. I told him no. Why'd you end up doing it? I don't know. Wasn't he supposed to run away when I said, when I said no? Uh-uh. You tell Satan no, he, he'll come back with, are you sure? Are you, are you sure? He's not running anywhere just because you said no. The word resist means to withstand. It is to resist with a purposed heart. This is how Daniel was able to face the lion's den. I'm telling you, year one, it's been six years since I've drank pop. Year one was tough. Year two was a little easier, but still tough. Right now, you can put it in front of me, and my desire is not really there for it anymore because I know what it does to me when I drink it. So I, I just don't want it anymore. Personal choice, again, personal choice. But it's not hard to walk away from it now. It's almost like it has fled from me. It's become easier because of the time that I've been away from it. I've resisted it long enough that it's not as, it doesn't have that draw that it once had. This is how Daniel was able to face the lion's den. He determined. He had a purpose heart. We're never going to be the Christian that God intended us to be until we do it on purpose. We've got to understand that. It's got to be purposed. You've got to do it on purpose. Are we tired of going back and forth? Yeah, I'm chasing after God. I got out of church today and I'm on fire for God. Let's do it for God. And then somebody shows the fizz of sin over here. Like, oh, I just want to feel the burn. Just, just that little fizzy burn. And the, the, and you smell that sin and it's just that citrusy flavor just pops back up. And you're like, all right, just this once. You've, all you did was reinforce the weakness that's already in you when we go back. Well, are we tired of going back and forth? Are we tired of saying, okay, God, I'm, I'm all in. And then later on that day, there we go again, and we're just consuming the sin. We just put it right back into our life. Are we tired of going back and forth? Because until we are, we're going to continue to go back and forth. We have to recognize that the harm that we are doing to ourselves by sinning is greater than the pleasure that we're getting out of it. The reason I don't want to go back to drink a Mountain Dew anymore is because I remember the sinus infections I used to get. <laughs> I remember how miserable I was. And, you know, it's not worth the pleasure that I would get out of it right now is not worth going back and trading it for the harm that I was getting out of it. And until we see sin that same way, we're not going to walk away from sin. We're just going to go right back to it. We've got to determine, we've got a purpose in our heart not to defile ourselves and hurt our relationship with God. But you've got to do it on purpose. Are we tired of hurting? Are we tired of carrying that guilt? Are we tired of feeling that void that only God can fill in our life? If we want to grow closer to God, then we need to do it. But we've got to do it on purpose. You've got to do it on purpose. Because it's, uh, uh, growing closer to Christ is not a, it's got to be, it's an intentional thing. It's something that you determined. It's something that you made yourself move forward to. It's not something that's just going to happen. You've got to do it on purpose. Right now, we just got to ask ourselves, am I tired? Am I tired of going back and forth? Because hopefully, hopefully that illustration helps us see what we do with sin. Yeah, the pleasures are there, but the effects are on us. We're going to kill ourselves by doing that. We're going to destroy our lives with that sin. The consequences of sin, the way it hurts us, have to override the pleasures that we get out of it. Otherwise, we will never walk away from it. And that's something that you're going to have to ask within your own life, and that's something I have to ask within my own life. And we have to determine which side we're going to stand on. Stand with me this morning. Dear me, Father, I do thank you so much for the examples that you give us in the Bible.